So this, the first speaker of today is uh, Juan Pablo Aguilera. And Juan Pablo has uh, done his PhD in 2019 under supervision of uh, Matthias Bartz, David Fernandes Duque, and Yu Woodin. Juan Pablo has um, won a prize for his PhD thesis, the so-called Beth Prize, named after Dutch uh, logician Beth. And um, he has also spent uh, uh, several months in Harvard with Yu Woodin to, to study uh, the same set theory. And Juan Pablo is a world expert in set theory and proof theory. And today he is speaking um, about the pi two consequences of the theory. And this is joint work together with Fyodor Pakomov. So please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, let's go. Um, oh. Sorry. I lost my slides. Okay. No. Yes. Okay. So this is, yes, this is joint work with Fyodor Pakomov and everything, 100% of what I'll talk about today. I'll start with a um, brief history of maybe of proof theory, it's at least the history of something. <laughs> so in the 19th century, Cantor defined the ordinal numbers. And that's, that's where our story begins. Then in 1900, Hilbert's 10th problems were given in his address to the ICM. I found out that actually he didn't have 23 problems at the beginning. He had 10 problems that he talked about in the Congress. And then he expanded his list in the published version. So that's an interesting thing, I think. And within those 10 problems, problem one was the continuum hypothesis. And problem two was proving that the axioms of arithmetic are consistent. So 20% of the problems were logic, at least. The first two. Then in 1931, Goodell's incompleteness theorem came along, which said that problem two cannot have a full solution as one would have wanted. So then the question is, what is the best we can do? What's the closest we can get to a solution? There was an answer in 1936 of Gensen, um, where he proved that arithmetic is consistent. And well, the only thing is you can't formalize the proof in arithmetic by Gödel's theorem. So what's the thing that doesn't work? Well, you need to go by an induction in the proof and the induction has length, a certain recursive ordering and the, the length of the ordering is epsilon zero. And um, well, arithmetic can't do that. Then Takuti in 1967 proved stronger versions of Gensen's theorem for subsystems of analysis, uh, like pi 1 1 comprehension. And it was, uh, it was uh, the same spirit of the proof, but now the induction is much more complicated because the proofs have to be more complicated. And then one could ask, can one give solutions to Hilbert's second problem by generalizing Gensen's and Takuti's theorem? So, Here's the definition. Let's say that the pi zero one norm is the least ordinal such that you can prove the consistency of T by induction along a well ordering of length alpha. Turns out this is not a very interesting notion or at least it's not a very useful notion because Chrysler showed that it's always equal to omega provided that T is consistent and recursively enumerable. So then we need a, a different measure if we want to measure the, the strength of a theory. And one such option is the pi one one ordinal of the theory. So it's the least ordinal alpha such that T does not prove the well-foundedness of any well-ordering of the natural numbers of length alpha. It doesn't immediately seem to capture the spirit that we're after, but it's a, it's a better behaved notion. So it's, better, it's a better thing to look at. So there's a theorem that I don't know if it's due to somebody. It says, suppose T is pi one one sound and recursively enumerable, then it's pi one one ordinal, it's recursive. 
and it's just by the sigma one one boundedness theorem. And if it's not pi one one sign, we will write that the pi one one norm of T is equal to omega one CK. So then a question is given such a T, what is the pi one one ordinal of T? This is a slightly more precise question, still not quite, but it's a better thing to look at. And one can give answers to this question. So determining the pi one one ordinal of T amounts to identifying the recursive ordinals that are well-founded provably in T. But ordinals are complete pi one one. So this really means understanding, having a good understanding of all the pi one one consequences of T. So we could define ordinal analysis as the study of mathematical theories in terms of their pi one one consequences. And uh, truth be told, this is a bit tricky because if you ask five proof theorists what ordinal analysis is, you'll get around eight different answers probably. But this is one of them. So then the question is, is there an analog of ordinal analysis suitable for the study of the pi one two consequences of theories? And that's what we will look at today. So what are we going to do today? We're going to outline the general theory of such an analog and give a definition of the pi one two norm of T. We're going to apply this notion to pi one two consequences of arithmetic or ACA zero. We will introduce the pi one two soundness ordinal of a theory. I'll say what that is later and then do things with it. Then I'll talk about the sigma one two soundness ordinal of a theory and compute it for some theories. Yeah, well, that's it. By the way, how, how much time do I have? Um, when am I supposed to? Uh, you have one hour. One hour. OK, including uh, plus questions. Questions, another 15 minutes on top. OK, it might, I might be done before then. We'll see. So let's do some preliminaries. Uh, the situation is ordinals are a pi one one concept. So if we want to study things that are not pi one one, we have to forget the idea that ordinals is a measure of strength. So that, that's not good for studying uh, consequences beyond pi one one. And the solution is to work with dilators or tykes more generally. Uh, so I'll say what these are. These were introduced by Jiha in the 1980s, or I guess he came up with the idea before, um, let's say 1980s. So let's think of ordinals as a category where objects are ordinals and morphisms are strictly order preserving mappings. So I have a picture here. Um, we have an alpha that gets mapped to f of alpha, beta gets mapped to f of beta, and then a morphism gets mapped to another morphism. My plan originally was to do drawings live in the talk, but I couldn't figure out how to get that working. So all the drawings are already done, which is why the, the talk might be shorter. So we'll consider special types of functors. So we'll put some additional constraints. So a partial order is directed if whenever you have two points, there's a point that's bigger than the two of them. Now, suppose we have a directed set of structures, let's say in first order logic, and the order is embeddability. Then we can define a direct limit of the set. Um, a way of doing it is we look at equivalence classes, p comma x, where p is an element of the directed set, and X is an element of P. And then we say that two classes are equal if letting an R be bigger than the two structures, which exists by directedness and embeddings in the directed system, the two elements get mapped to the same point. And then, yeah, that's the construction. So this is the model theoretic notion of a direct limit. So suppose we have a directed system of ordinals and a functor on ordinals, then there is a natural directed system, which we get, well, the objects of the directed system are the, the things you had, and then you apply F to all the points. And then all the morphisms that you had in the directed system, 
you apply F to them and that's it. So on the one hand, you have the directed system and then you could take its limit and then apply F to that. And on the other hand, you could apply F to the directed system, get a new directed system and compute its limit, um, its direct limit. And then, well, if the two things are equal, then we will say that F preserves direct limits or commutes with direct limits. So um, there's another notion. Suppose we have objects x1, 2, 3, and x, and embeddings f1 from x1 to x and from f2 to x. Then we say that f3 from the object x3 to x is the pullback of f1 and f2, and write it like this. If there are embeddings from x3 to x1 and from x2 to, sorry, this should be from x3 to x2, such that everything commutes and F3 is universal. So here's the drawing. We have X and then we have morphisms from X1 and X2. And then the pullback will be this function F3 defined from some set X3 and the embedding factors through F1 and F2 in this way. And the universality condition is that if we have another object Y and embeddings from y to x2 and from y to x1, uh, such that um, this is a, a limit of the diagram. Well, this is a, yeah, if you have another y here, then you're gonna have an embedding from y to x3. So yeah, that's the definition of a pullback. Well, the pullback is f. And these always exist for ordinals. Um, so this is a categorical notion of limit, unlike the direct limit, which is a model theoretic notion of limit. And in category theory, that would be a co-limit. But I'm going to call it a direct limit. So we say that, that a functor f on ordinals commutes with pullbacks if the pullback of f of f1 and f of f2 is f applied to the pullback of f1 and f2. And a dilator is going to be a functor on ordinals, which commutes with direct limits and pullbacks. And that's it. That's the notion. And um, we won't make... So uh, there, there are not going to be any proofs in this talk, because I wasn't sure there was going to be enough time. Um, though now I think that there would have. So it's not crucial if you, if somebody forgets what these definitions are, but try not to. So, but this is the central notion, a dilator, and it was defined by Jihad. Um, let's talk about natural transformations. So a transformation from F to G is a family of mappings. So for each element of the category A, you have a mapping T alpha that maps F alpha to G alpha. And the regularity property is that whenever you have a morphism from alpha to beta, then T beta after F applied to F is the same as G applied to F after T alpha. And um, we will denote DIL, the functor category of dilators, where morphisms are natural transformations. So we have the ordinals as a category, and now we moved to dilators. Um, we're going to say that dilator is countable if it maps countable ordinals to countable ordinals. And uh, here's the main observation. Every ordinal is the direct limit of the collection of its finite subsets. So every ordinal you can write as a direct limit of finite ordinals. And that's very useful because then if you have a dilator, then because everything commutes nicely, it's uniquely determined by its restriction to finite ordinals and finite morphisms. So if D is countable, then this data is countable. You have only a countable amount of data that codes the whole dilator, which is a proper class. Uh, namely, you 
have to say what D does to every finite ordinal and every finite morphism between ordinals. And so you can code it by real number. And uh, the collection of real numbers which code countable dilators is pi one two complete. So that was the background. Let's move on to the real content of the talk. Here's the central definition. Let T be a theory. We will write T is the pi one two norm of, sorry, D is the pi one two norm of T of the following hold. Suppose T proves that F is a dilator, then F embeds into D. So D absorbs all the provable dilators of T. And D is universal for this condition in the sense that if you have another D hat, such that all the provable dilators of T embed into D hat, then there's a natural transformation from D into D hat. And here's the diagram. We have the pi one two norm here, and we have all the provable dilators of T here. That's what this equality is saying. And they all embed into T one two. And if you have another D hat with this property, then there's an embedding from T12 to D. So this is an analog of the pi 1 1 ordinal. In the, in the case of pi 1 1 ordinals, you had all the provable well orders here. And the least element, the least ordinal not in this set was the pi 1 1 norm. So in ordinals, the existence of an embedding is the same as the ordinal being bigger than the other one. So you take the least element not in the set, and then there's an embedding here, and you have this universality condition, because if you have another ordinal that is bigger, well, it's not going to be smaller than the least element not in the set. So you'll have this embedding. So if you replace all the Ds here by ordinals and all the arrows by order preserving injections, strict order preserving, then this, is, this would give you the definition of the pi 1 1 ordinal. The difference is that it's not clear here that this should always exist. So, well, we need at least the T is pi one two sound because if we want this to be a dilator. And um, the first observation is that it's actually easy to find a dilator which bounds all the provable dilators because there's a sigma one one bound in this theorem for dilators, just like for ordinals. And it's due independently to Girard and Norman and to Kekris and Wooden. Uh, but that's not enough because then we might not have universality. So it's not, it's not very obvious. And in the definition of the pi 1 1 ordinal, this was not an issue because you, as, as soon as you had boundedness, well, ordinals are well ordered. So you take the least bounding ordinal, and that's the pi 1 1 norm. But dilators are not well ordered with respect to embeddability. Uh, nonetheless, the, the theorem is that it, it exists. So suppose T is pi one two sound, then pi one two norm of T exists and it's unique up to by embeddability. Moreover, if T is recursively enumerable, then the dilator can be taken to be recursive. So this is really an analog of the existence of pi one one norms for theories. Um, so that's, that's the theorem that I, I won't prove. There's another theorem that says, suppose T is pi one two sound and recursively enumerable, and it extends ACA zero, then take, let D be the pi one two norm, then every pi one two consequence of T is provable in the theory, ACA zero plus D is a dilator. Why is this? Because um, ACA zero knows that dilators are pi one two complete, so if you feed to ACA zero the statement that this is a dilator, um, at least if you present D appropriately. So every, every countable structure has many different presentations. Choose a good presentation that's recursive in particular. Um, if, if you choose, for example, the one that we get from the theorem, then all the embeddings from the provable dilators to the pi one two norm will be recursive actually. So then in this theory, you can know that all the provable dilators are indeed dilators, and then you'll get all the pi one two consequences back. So T pi one two is a functor on ordinals. And uh, if we restrict to ordinals, it induces a function from ordinals to ordinals. So what is this function? 
Here's a definition of Pakomov and Walsh. By TB a theory, they define the proof theory dilator of a theory is the function which maps A to the pi 1 1 ordinal of T plus alpha is well ordered. So they define this as a function in ordinals. So here's the theorem. Suppose T is pi 1 2 sound and D is the pi 1 2 norm of T. Then T of alpha is equal to the proof theoretic to the pi 1 1 ordinal of T plus alpha is well ordered. So they're the same, they're the same thing when restricted to ordinals. So we might call T pi 1 2 the proof theoretic dilator of T. Um, the pi 1 2 norm of T is a countable recursive object, which codes the class sized function indicated here in the definition of Pakhomov and Walsh. Let's give a concrete description of the pi 1 2 norm of ACA0. I'll give a description, but I won't, I won't prove the fact that I'm describing the thing that, I think that, I, that I'm saying I'm describing. So by the previous theorem, we, we must have ACA0 pi 1, 2 applied to alpha is the, the smallest epsilon number greater than alpha. Um, the thing is, this is a functor. So we don't, it's not enough to describe its value in ordinals. We need to say what it does to morphisms as well. So here's the definition. Uh, suppose alpha is an ordinal and D iota is a dilator for each iota less than alpha. Then we can define its sum. And this is a very natural definition. D gamma is just the sum of all the D iota applied to gamma. So these are ordinals, we can take the sum. And suppose we have a morphism F from beta to gamma, then D applied to F will be a function from D of beta to D of gamma. So what is this function? Take an element here in D beta. What does your typical element of this ordinal look like? Well, it's going to be in some structure like this. So it'll consist of a sum of D iota prime applied to beta for some iota. And then it's going to have an extra chunk, which is smaller than D iota. So what is, what is this function going to do? It's going to take all these chunks that were complete and then map them to their image. So D iota prime gamma, you take the sum over all iota prime less than iota. And then for the extra chunk that you had, you're going to apply D iota of F to it. And that's the, that's, the, that's the functor. Let's define an exponential functor given by X alpha is omega to the alpha. And suppose we have F from alpha to beta, then what is this going to do? Take an element of omega to the alpha, uh, you write it in Cantor normal form, and then apply f to the exponents. And that's going to give you something here. So the theorem is that the pi 1, 2 norm of AC0 is the infinite sum of all the iterated exponentials. Um, let me just point out that if we apply this function to 0, then we have this expression. What is that? Is that that's the supremum of iterated exponentials applied to zero. So what is that? Zero exponentials is one, one exponential is omega, two exponentials is omega to the omega, and so on. So it's epsilon zero, which is what we knew was going to happen. And the theorem, the proof of the theorem involves embedding proofs from AC0 into a beta calculus and then doing proof theory with that. But now it's all functorial. Uh, it's a topic for another occasion. Now, let's get to the next part of the talk. By the pi 1, 2 norm theorem, the pi 1, 2 norm of T is defined whenever T is pi 1, 2 sound. Is there anything we can do for theories that are not pi 1, 2 sound? Why would we do this? I think there are at least two, maybe three reasons why one would look at pi 1, 2 unsound theories. One reason is that these theories show up all the time in reverse mathematics and in set theory. Suppose, for example, you want to prove lower bounds for Borel determinacy. Your proof is going to start by saying, suppose there is no transitive model of Zermelo set theory or Zermelo plus 
the epsilon zero exists or whatever your lower bound you want it to be. And those are not proofs by contradiction. Those are contrapositive. So the theories you're working with are actually perfectly valid theories, which are pi one, two unsound. So these theories do show up in practice and I think it's worth looking at them because there's benefit to that. Another reason one might argue philosophically that maybe somebody doesn't know whether a theory is pi one two sound or it's pi one two unsound. So then in that case, they might be looking at a pi one two unsound theory for whatever reason. Uh, for me, the greatest argument for looking at pi one two unsound theories is that there are things to say about them that I think are interesting as we will see. So here's the definition. Let T be a theory. O12 of T is the least ordinal alpha such that D alpha is ill-founded for some D such that T proves that D is a dilator. So we look at all the things that T proves are dilators, but now T might not be pi one two sound. So some of those things might not actually be dilators. So there are functions from well orders to linear orders. And then at some point, they're going to map something well-founded to something ill-founded. We'll look at the least alpha where this happens. That's the pi one two ordinal of t. There are many ways you could define this ordinal. And you might ask, why are we defining it this way? Why are we are defining it this way? And the reason is that you get interesting consequences, I think, if you define it this way. So all one, two of T is a measure of how close T is to being pi one, two sound. And unlike the pi one, two norm, this is always defined for any T, assuming we allow it to take infinity as a value. Uh, but now this is, we're back to ordinals. This is an ordinal number. So it, it's not gonna capture the pi one, two consequences of T. And we can think of a kind of quasi pi one, two analysis of T. Determine O12 of T for a given T. And there's an associated spectrum problem which says, well, which ordinals alpha are of the form O12 of T for some RE extension of ACA0 of T? For example, you can ask if it can ever be non recursive, if it can be admissible, if it can be a successor, if it can be uncountable. Um, Actually, it's, it's kind of easy to see that it cannot be uncountable by a Levenheim's column argument. If anyone's worked with zero sharp, for example, it's the same argument. So the meta thesis that I, I'm gonna make is that this ordinal gives you useful information about T. So that's maybe the mindset that I have in mind for, for the talk. So let's make a definition. Let T be an RE extension of ACA0. We're gonna say that T is of category A if it's pi one two soundness ordinal is zero. It's, this, it's of category B if it's pi one two ordinal is non-zero, but it's recursive. It's of category C if it's pi one two ordinal is non-recursive, but it's not infinity. And it's of category D if it's equal to infinity. So here's a picture we have um, category A, B, C, and D. And this was supposed to be red, but the app that I was using for drawing didn't have red somehow. So it's purple. Um, I guess now I'm looking that I could have combined it with orange. Okay. So here's a picture. So what can we say about a theory based on its category? So here's the first observation. Let delta one two denote the least ordinal, which is not the order type of a delta one two ordering, well ordering of the natural numbers. Then delta one two is equal to the supremum of the pi one two soundness ordinal theory, uh, theories T, such that T is an RE extension of ACA zero and it's pi one two ordinal is defined or it's not infinity. And you can also do it for sigma one two extensions of ACA zero. And uh, so we get this corollary. Let T be a recursively enumerable extension of ACA0, then the following are equivalent. T is in category D, 
So the O12 of T is equal to infinity. If and only if it's O12 is greater than or equal to delta 12, if and only if T is pi 12 sound. So that's the what we can say of theories in category D. For category A, we have the following our equivalent. T is in category A. So it's pi 12 ordinal is zero. If and only if it's pi 12 ordinal is less than its proof theoretic ordinal. If and only if T is not pi 11 sound. So remember that we defined that the pi 11 ordinal of T was equal to omega 1 CK if T was not pi 11 sound. So if T is not pi 11 sound, then this is saying that O12 is recursive. Um, but actually just demanding that it's smaller than it's pi 11 ordinal will send it to zero. So there are some gaps in the spectrum. So here's an updated picture. And it starts at epsilon zero because we're looking at extensions of phase zero. So if it's not zero, the least it could be is epsilon zero. So what about theories in category B and category C? Um, let's look at category C. Let T be a recursively enumerable extension of ACA0, the following are equivalent. T is in category C, so it's pi 1, 2 ordinal, is non-recursive and not infinity. And um, well, we knew from before that that's the same as requiring that it's non-recursive and less than delta 1, 2. And that's equivalent to saying that T is, pi, is sound for Boolean combinations of pi 1, 1 sentences. So it's pi 1, 2 ordinal is not recursive if and only if it's, oh, so I guess this should say it's not only if it's Boolean pi 1, 1 sound, but not pi 1, 2 sound. Because if it were pi 1, 2 sound, then it would be in category D. So, but if it's Boolean pi 1, 1 sound, if and only if it's pi 1, 2 or no, it's non-recursive. And then we conclude the classification of category, theories in category B. So it's in category B if and only if it's pi 1, 2 or no, it's between omega 1 CK and it's pi 1, 1 or no, if and only if T is pi 1, 1 sound, but not Boolean pi 1, 1 sound. So here's an updated picture. Uh, we have the theories as before, but here we say these are the pi 1, 1 sound theories, and these are the Boolean pi 1, 1 sound theories, and these are the pi 1, 2 sound theories. So by definition, the spectrum of category A is this ordinal, just zero, and the spectrum of category D is just infinity. So the spectrum problem is only non-trivial for theories in categories B and C. So here's the result for category B. Alpha is the O12 of a theory T for some T in category B, if and only if alpha is a recursive epsilon number. So these are the epsilon, the recursive epsilon numbers. Uh, for a category C, we don't really have a full answer, but we have an answer for admissible ordinals. So let me say what the answer is. Let alpha be an ordinal and phi be a formula in some language, like first order logic or second order logic. Let's say alpha reflects phi. If L alpha satisfies phi implies that there's a beta smaller than alpha such that L beta satisfies phi. And we say that alpha is light phase sigma one one reflecting or parameter free sigma one one reflecting. If it reflects every sigma one one sentence without parameters in the language of set theory. So normally you define a sigma one one reflecting ordinal to be one which reflects sigma one one sentences, but you allow parameters less than alpha. So that's in general a more well-behaved notion, but not in this case, it's not what we want. Though in many cases they will coincide because the point is that for many ordinals, you will have a bijection between alpha and omega, which is definable without parameters in a simple way. This will happen all the way through the first model of second order arithmetic. And if so, then the two notions will coincide because every element will be definable using this bijection and a natural number. So, and natural numbers are definable without parameters. So the, no the notions will coincide. So here's a spectrum theorem for admissible ordinals. Let alpha be admissible, then the following are equivalent. 
Alpha is the pi one two soundness ordinal of some recursively enumerable extension of ACA zero, if and only if alpha is not light phase sigma one one reflecting. So in particular, you can find a theory T whose pi one two soundness ordinal is omega one CK. And the proof, I like the proof. It's a, it's a short proof, but it, it, it's like curry. It has like a little bit of everything. Um, it has beta proofs, forcing. Um, I, I hope I, I get to talk about it at some point. So here's the final version of the picture that I'll show you. We have the ordinals here. We have category A, which is just zero. We have category B, which are the epsilon numbers. We have category C. At least I'm only drawing the admissible ordinals because that's what we know. So you have omega 1 CK, omega 2 CK. And then at some point you get to the least sigma 1 1 reflecting ordinal. That's also the least ordinal, which is sigma 1 1 reflecting without parameters for admissibles. And then uh, we have a bunch of other ordinals. And then, yeah, the, the picture looks like they're getting closer together, but that's still the scale of the picture. You can't draw this to scale. And, uh, but yeah, there, there are many gaps. And yeah, these are the Boolean pi 1 1 sound theories. These are the pi 1 1 sound theories. And these are the pi 1 2 sound theories. So that's what I have to say about um, the results that Fyodor and I have on the pi 1 2 soundness ordinals, ordinal. So let's talk about the sigma 1 2 soundness ordinal. So it's a kind of dual to O12. Well, O12 measures the simplest false pi12 consequence of T. This ordinal measures the most complicated true sigma12 consequence of T. So it seems like it's actually a more natural definition because maybe you're more interested in true things than you are in false things. Um, though I guess maybe it's the same. Um, I guess you're, maybe you're more interested in sound theories than in unsound theories, which may, may be. But the thing is the other ordinal, which at first sight seems a bit more unnatural, it, it gives you more information is what it seems. So I'll define the notion. Uh, Predilator is the functor D on the category of linear orders, which preserves direct limits and pullbacks. So a dilator is a predilator, which also preserves well-foundedness. So suppose T is sigma one, two sound for each recursive predilator D, such that T proves D is not a dilator. Let's say alpha D is the least ordinal such that D alpha D is still founded. And then we define S12 of T to be the supremum of all these ordinals. So you look at, all the predilators that T proves these are not dilators. And then with that information, you go to the real world and look at where the least counterexamples to dilatorness show up and take their supremum. That's the S12 of T. And um, yeah, so here's a, here's a theorem. It says suppose T is pi 1, 2 sound. It's pi 1, 2 sound, RE extension of ACA0 then the S12 of T is strictly between the pi 1, 1 ordinal of T and the pi 1, 2 ordinal of T. Uh, well, here you might have less than or equal, and actually you can have both options for different Ts. And um, the soup of all the S12 of Ts for pi one, uh, sigma 1, 2 sound RE extensions of AC0 is also delta 1, 2. And um, this is my last slide. Here's the computation of some sigma 1, 2 soundness ordinals. The S12 of ACA0 is omega 1 CK. The S12 of pi 1, 1 comprehension is omega omega CK. The S12 of pi 1, 2 comprehension is the least ordinal, which is stable to the least non predictable. Uh, so maybe these two are kind of predictable, but this one is. I think maybe a bit unexpected. Um, but that's how it is. So yeah, actually I finished very quickly. That's the end of my talk. Um, maybe I'll just emphasize once more that all the theorems are joined with Theodore. 
Yeah, thank you very much.